Hi everyone, and welcome to Exceptional Individuals webinar on Dyslexia v Dyscalculia. I'm Nat, and I'm the head of community at our humble social enterprise. And I have dyslexia diagnosed, and I'm almost certain I have dyscalculia. And today we're going to be going in, diving in deep to what is it, what's the differences, and why it might be harder to be diagnosed with one and rather than than both because the thing we i think one of the common misconceptions that i want you to walk away today if you learn anything is that dyslexia can affect maths and english it affects both and dyscalculia is not dyslexia of the maths world you know that, that those are the common the most common things but if that's not the case what exactly is it if dyslexia can also be trouble with maths and dyscalculia isn't even trouble with maths what is it it's a it's a fine distinction but we'll go into it but do remember as we go throughout there are going to be slight contradictions because the definitions overlap a lot and the differences are sometimes quite minor but sometimes quite profound for example, you can have dyslexia and not have dyscalculia, and you can have dyscalculia and not have dyslexia, though the likelihood of having them both is quite common. And uh, it's a bit of a tongue twister, all these disses, so apologies if I end up saying the wrong one. So as mentioned, at this organisation, um, we are a social enterprise, meaning we support people because we actually care. <laughs> um, so everything we deliver to individuals is always free, and we're able to run because of the work we do with organisations, which allows us to fund this part of the business or organisation. And we mainly support uh, neurodivergence, so things like dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism and ADHD. But that's only the top of the iceberg when it comes to neurodivergent conditions. There's also dyscalculia, which we'll be talking about today, dysgraphia, Tourette's, OCD, there's a whole spectrum of it. But I like to do a quick definition because when we talk about neurodiversity, a lot of people think we are talking about just autism, when in fact neurodiversity is a whole spectrum of diverse thought. So neuro, brain, diversity, everyone. So everyone you've ever met has neurodiversity, but it's when we're talking about things like neurodivergent, it comes under the things we're going to be discussing today. And if you hear the term neurotypical, that relates to people who have the predominant way of thinking. So most people in society. Oh, Joey says, I know there's a thing called hyperlexia, but is there also a thing called hypercalculia? Just curious. Well, Joe, it's interesting because I have found reports where that is a thing, but not much information on it. So I would imagine there probably is, but I'm definitely not an expert on hypercalculia. <laughs> if any of you have never heard of what hyperlexia is, it's in some ways it's the opposite of dyslexia. It's when you are really beyond your years good at reading from a young age but it might mean that you also struggle with verbal communication. So you could have a delay in early age when it comes to speaking, but when it comes to writing, reading, you tend to be way above your peers. It does tend to become less prominent and noticeable as you get older. This is why not many adults are diagnosed with it. I personally haven't met a single adult that has been diagnosed in adult life, but quite a few people who were diagnosed younger and you know, it has continued. But interestingly, hyperlexia is more closely aligned with autism than it is dyslexia, despite the naming. Oh, Megan says, I got diagnosed with slow processing skills, but not sure if that's classed as dyslexia or anything else. Okay, Megan. Well, typically on that, it's sometimes you might not have all the characteristics of dyslexia in order to come under that, diagnos that diagnosis. So they might do like things as like slow processing, um, learning disability, general processing condition. It's sometimes it's just due to who diagnosed you. Other times it's about what criteria you kind of matched on. But what I would say is maybe the labels labels aren't so important. It's more about if you resonate with some of the things we're talking about today, then a lot of the support strategies which have been known to work for those characteristics would also benefit you regardless of 
uh, a few words on a bit of paper. But that's just my view. So yeah, here's a little bit about us, a lovely team. And I think what makes us particularly unique is that the vast majority, 80% I hear, is neurodivergent. So we're experts by experience. So you'll be learning from people who have actually lived day to day with this particular way of processing information. So now for the main event, <laughs> dyslexia v dyscalculia. This isn't so much a fight, it's just comparing the differences and the similarities because they are very easily confused. Sometimes you might have dyslexia and not diagnosed with dyscalculia, but a lot of your characteristics more closely align to dyscalculia. And if that sounds confusing at the moment, well, hopefully we can break it down a bit more. So in an absolute nutshell, dyslexia describes a learning difference to read, write, and communicate. It can also impact maths, and that is a really crucial thing to take away from today. Whereas dyscalculia describes a learning difference that causes troubles with numbers and maths concepts. So let me break it down even further because I want to make sure we're all crystal clear. So dyslexia describes a learning difference and we say learning difference rather than disability as it's only a disability because of the society that has grown up around us. It's not inherently a disability, it's that the way that we are told to process the world doesn't align with the way we think. And also it allows you to know that there's nothing wrong with you, it's just you process different to the majority of the population. And we mentioned reading and writing, which a lot of us know about. Though FYI, if you struggle predominantly with writing, you may have a condition called dysgraphia, which we speak about in previous sessions, and communication. So communication can affect everything. And this also includes maths, like such as, you know, remember your short term memory, processing, all of that great stuff. Now, dyscalculia is also a learning difference, not necessarily a disability, but definitely can be debilitating depending on the scenarios and situations you find yourself in. And this is trouble with numbers and maths. Now, when we say trouble, we do not mean bad at maths. You can absolutely be a mathematician and have dyscalculia. It means, in theory, you understand the principles of mathematics, but when it comes to putting that theory into action, maybe it comes out wrong because of the way your brain sees numbers, it might read it wrong, or it might be just finding it very difficult to retain the information of, like, formulas. But you will be crystal clear on this by when we're done with the day. Oh, okay, we've got a little comment. How do you get diagnosed of it? I fit some criteria, but I'm not all but I'm not all always diagnosed. Well, to get diagnosed with dyscalculia, you typically have to go to an occupational therapist, a GP, a private assessor and specify that is something that you are wanting to explore. They tip, it won't be their go-to. I mean, typically people go for the standard dyslexia, dyspraxia, just because they're the most known ones. But we will hopefully by the end of the day, if you resonate enough with this, I would recommend getting in touch with us and we can always signpost you to someone which could do a diagnosis if you still think that's the best decision for you. But I'm not promoting nor unpromoting it. So just so we're all clear on that. Because I think it would be very unethical if I uh, said we deliver them and encourage you all to have one. So first of all, I'm going to ask you all some questions just to get some empathy going and to put in a real world practice, what does it actually mean to be dyslexic or dyscalculic? So the first one I want to ask you is, do you miss words when reading? So when you're reading a book, I'm not saying you can't read, but do you ever skip words Yes or no. And of course we all do it from time to time, but it's more about the frequency. Because if I was to tell you all these characteristics, you'd probably say yes, 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 yes to all of them. But that doesn't mean that you are. Like just saying you're depressed today doesn't mean you have depression. A lot of the time it's about the frequency and severity of how those characteristics affect you. So let's say you're, you're always missing words out when reading. Well, that could be a sign of dyslexia. So when it comes to reading, phonologics, breaking words down, sentences, this is definitely dyslexia. This isn't dyscalculia. Again, take everything I say with a pinch of salt because they all overlap, but 
this is normally what we refer to when referring to dyslexia. So the example we've got here is skipping words, sentences, or even several lines at a time. A very uh, common characteristic of those with dyslexia is kind of inserting their own words. And you might think, why is the brain doing this? This makes no sense. Well, actually, it kind of does because Evolutionary, we've always been programmed to find the quickest answer to the problem before anyone else. So we're able to skip a word and still make sense of the situation. Our brains will do that. Unfortunately, when our brains was developing this really great characteristic, it didn't. no one told it that the Industrial Revolution was coming and reading and writing would become essential. It would be right or wrong. There wouldn't be much room for grey. And I think that is the dyslexic brain. It's more about like finding hacks, but sometimes those hacks don't always fit in with how we expect them to work. Okay, Vicky says, when I read out loud, I recognize that the word is there, but don't actually read it. Yeah, I'm the same. I make up words all the time. So um, a lot of you are sometimes. So again, if it's sometimes, do not run straight away and tell everyone you're dyslexic. It's typically if it happens almost always but do know that a lot of these characteristics though they you are born with them you die with them they're lifelong they can change severity depending on your life situation so let's say you're really stressed or under you know sleep deprived you will notice you miss out words more often than what you would do say if you were fully calm and relaxed okay the next one is asking you what time is being shown here. So just take a quick glance at this clock and tell me what time is it? Obviously I'm exaggerating uh, today just for um, visualization purposes, but the point remains is that I'm assuming a lot of you are able to tell the time. And if you are, maybe you've learned to tell the time because you recognize the numbers or you can only read analog or only read digital. That's quite common with dyscalculia, and this is what we're, we're doing today, is that yes, you might be able to do the maths, but you only can do it in the one way you were taught. So you know how there's multiple ways to add up, subtract, or that classic problem of your parents not being able to help you with maths because they learned to solve it in a different way. That can relate to dyscalculia. So on this clock here, You'd, it's like every time you want to answer a question, you have to solve the maths in your head. So I'm guessing a lot of you were able to say it's 10-10 just by looking at the hands. But if I didn't have this in this kind of image and you only saw these, you'd have to work out the maths. And though the answer would be the same, it would take you a lot longer to answer. So kind of think of it when people might have dyscalculia. Can they do maths? Can they tell the time? Can they do these sorts of things? A lot of the times, yes, but is it going to take them a longer time? Absolutely, because the way that the brain sees the patterns, think of it, it kind of has to like decode it before it's able to give you the answer. For me, I can read, I really struggle with the time. So I can say 10, 10, but if I could say quarter to quarter past, it throws my brain off the rails. Or if you give me a 24 hour clock, Yes, I can work out. I normally take the time and I plus two, but it takes me longer. Uh, I can't do algebra. Don't worry, Sanjan. Algebra. There's no point for it. <laughs> Mega says, I don't always understand the questions. I have the information, but I can't put it into words. Yet, yeah, really, really common. Sandra says, I can't tell the time on an analog clock until I was in my late teens. Uh, same here. I, I was like late secondary school when I finally learned. Emma Y says, I'm so relieved that there are people on this call that have struggles with time. I've spent years trying to learn how to tell the time. And again, it's not your fault. It's not due to lack of intelligence. It's just due to the way that your brain processes information. So rather than pushing yourself to learn a type which doesn't suit your way of learning, find an alternative way. For this very reason, I never wear a watch because people always ask me the time and I panic <laughs> because uh, I can't tell you it on the dot. It would take me a few seconds to process. Yeah, so Kelly can tell the time but by memorizing the hand positions. So it's just a different way of doing it. Whether you look at the numbers, whether you remember the shapes. Oh, Mike says, my wife has never been able to understand left and right, but it's but is brilliant apart from that. Yeah, really common. That's something that, again, I really want you all to remember that 
both of these two ways of thinking do not relate to intelligence and that's really important okay the next one is this is just more of a statement than a question is what are the possible social and emotional impacts of both dyslexia and dyscalculia so we often talk about what it mean like what are the characteristics but what are the actual impacts so with dyslexia those with dyslexia may have a hard time understanding jokes or sarcasm, taking extra time to come up with words or to answer questions that can make fitting in hard too. This is interesting because this sounds like autism, doesn't it? About struggling to understand jokes and characteristics. But this is something that we don't realise is that it all overflows. Because dyslexia can be uh, like skipping words, a lot of the time jokes are like little puns with words, they might be the odd spelling, things might be done in a different way. So I'm not saying all jokes, but maybe like when you're reading a joke, you don't, you don't get it because your brain has missed that punchline. Which is different to why autistic people may struggle with jokes. So sometimes the output can be the same, but the way you get to the output can be quite different. Then we've got dyscalculia. So those with dyscalculia might also avoid playing games or sports that involve maths and keeping score. And this is an interesting one because we often associate, you know, not liking sports with things like dyspraxia, which is about fine motor coordination skills, but it can also affect those with dyscalculia, not because they're probably bad at sports, but because they might have to do maths, it's really difficult. A classic example is, I, uh, I love playing with darts, you know, but I hate the game darts because you have to do all the maths in your head. So I will actively avoid it at all costs. Or I might do a game like Around the Clock where you just go one, two, three, four, rather than having to do any sort of maths in your head. So if you find that you naturally avoid those sports for that reason, it might just be because it doesn't come naturally to you and maybe you're very... You feel insecurities about how people might perceive you. Yeah, um, so Sanchez, I've always avoided playing darts because of the scoring. Honestly, it's awful. Uh, I like going to, I don't know, in London somewhere, there's this uh, pub where they have like those electronic dart boards and it adds it up for you. And uh, what a game changer. Oh yeah, Emma says, I've always avoided being the bankrupt monopoly. My kids laugh, but it makes me feel worse. Do you know what? I'm the same. One, because I cheat. <laughs> but um, two, it's just the, the banker is, you know, because when you give people the wrong money, it's just it's just too much going on. And it really isn't to say that you couldn't be the banker if you had all the time in the world. But for a fast paced of the game, not going to work for you. It's the same way like, I can't do Scrabble for my dyslexia. Gillian says, I have found as I have got older, when I could do some minor calculations in my head, it just gets stuck in my head more than ever even using a calculator and that's really common as well it's sometimes difficult to say about when age is you know is it due to dys dyscalculia or not it's hard to say but all these things are interconnected so i try not to see them as individual all right now back on to question time and we got hello kitty to help us on this one when writing quickly I miss out dot 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 and this as you may have guessed relates to dyslexia not dyscalculia but rather than just telling you that it relates to it I like to explain why so missing out letters is quite common it's um you know I've been doing my family tree lately and one thing I've noticed the further you go back in time the more likely it is that people have different spellings of their surnames because to be honest, people didn't really care. Well, it, that's not the full truth, but I don't think people cared as much about the correct spellings. As long as you understood it and it sounded the same, people cared more about the sounding rather than the spelling. But we've become a bit more like, there's less flexibility these days, particularly with uh, like that we do things digitally. So it's not uncommon. Missing words, again, not a surprise because our brain is always looking for the fastest answer and sometimes words might be deemed as irrelevant or not necessary think of like the dyslexic brain as like someone who does shorthand you know we don't need to write every single word in order to read it back and understand it the difficulty comes though when someone else wants to read it back and can't or the difficulty comes when we can't even remember what we wrote 
And, and that's the thing. I'm sure, have any of you ever been told, what well, you mean you can't read your own writing? No, no, definitely can. Because you've got the challenges of short-term memory and the challenges of skipping words altogether. So then it comes a bit like a puzzle solving your own writing. Capital letters, yep. Even if you've been taught in school. So the key thing here, this isn't because you haven't learned in school that capital letters and full stops are important. It's because you, your brain just doesn't see them as necessary and will skip them. So if this is something that always happens as an adult, it comes down because you've got you're, in your brain, you've got like lots of neurons, right? And you've got pathways that essentially think of them like telephone wires that sends the information. And every time you send an information, it's like working out and it gets stronger and thicker. Uh, so the more you do something, the more it's reinforced. And that's typically how we learn. But it can also happen in like the less productive way. So if you're always missing out full stops, it actually gets harder and harder to correct that pattern or repetition the older you get. So uh, this is why using software like Global Autocorrect or Grammarly can be quite useful as an adult, because I know my brain isn't going to learn that now, so, so I'd rather it just corrects it. Megan says, grammar and punctuation is the worst for me. Kellia says, I took an exam once, handwritten, and finished much earlier than everyone else. I made the mistake of not reading it all back carefully. I did not score as highly as I thought I would have done and talked to the professor. She handed me back my paper and made me reread it. I left out entire parts of the sentences and bits read as gibberish. I'm always amazed as well. Like, I can read things and I'm like, it's, it's perfect. Uh, but then when I like get my computer to read it, I've missed out so much. This is why I use um, text-to-speech software a lot, because it really does help with comprehension. Okay, now for our maths question. How far from New York will it be when the two trains meet? So the, the question is, if train A leaves Chicago traveling 100 miles per hour, and train B leaves New York traveling 150 miles per hour, and the distance between the two cities is 600 miles, how far from New York will it be when the two trains meet? Good luck if you can do this. I have no idea myself. Yeah, Kelly says, hates this type of question. It makes no sense. Vicky, you lost me at train. <laughs> yeah, this is, again, I'm, I'm not doing this to make any of you feel dumb or silly. I'm purposely doing more difficult ones to demonstrate how what dyscalculia can look like. So... Let's say, in theory, a lot of us maybe could work this out. But when it comes to solving the answer, it, particularly in our heads, we can't do it. Because, uh, think of it like, okay, so the brain is thinking of one thing. Oh, sorry, you can't see. Then think of another thing. And think of another thing. And it's like, you're kind of like, you're holding so many things. And it gets confused and juggled up. And before long, the brain drops it all. And then you have to start again. So yes, some of you may not be able to work this out because you haven't learned this type of maths. But even if you have learned this maths, you may still struggle with it. So most of you had says it's 2.4 hours. To be honest with you, I can't tell you whether that's true or not. But I'm going to trust the majority. Agree, Sanjan. No idea how to even start. Ask me once about cricket. <laughs> now, on which number is higher? Is it minus 5 or minus 6? Okay, okay, they're all coming in. And again, this one at first might seem fairly straightforward because we know when we do like a number line that when it comes to minus, it kind of flips around and it's the opposite. So minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, three, four. But this isn't, the, but people with dyscalculia, for example, might get this wrong. This isn't because they do not understand the order of numbers, but let's say you just skip the minus and you just see five or six, you're going to put six. So in your head, you had the correct answer. Your brain just didn't read it. <laughs> so it, that's a lot of the time. It's that, they, that that's, this is why it doesn't affect intelligence. It just affects the way that the brain processes the information. So the way that you are read the question in your head was maybe not the right answer but the math you did in your head to get the answer if you thought five or six was correct a bit confusing but hopefully you get the gist 
And so if someone is struggling with maths and may have dyscalculia or dyslexia, this is why different approaches and techniques can really help someone. I once met someone who was, uh, you know, pretty competent in maths, you know, really good. However, their brain just couldn't read the number five. And I've never seen anything like it before, but it's that they'd always mistake it for a six. No matter how many times they tried to remember it, any math problem with a five in would always come out wrong. So what we ended up doing is on their phone and calculator, every time there was a five, we always colored it like red. So they remember their numbers and colors rather than actual like symbols. I'm not gonna say that's gonna work for you. I think that's a pretty unique case, but interesting and kind of lets you know that it's not, it's just our brain creates patterns and connections and that's beyond our control, I'd say, pretty much all the time. Okay, this one, I've done this quite a lot if you've been in a few presentations before, but I always think it's an interesting one. You keep sleeping through your alarm clock. What is a creative solution? So on this one, I want you to come up with the most wackiest, craziest, inventive ways possible on how you can make sure you do not sleep through your alarm clock. Megan says, get your pet to wake you up. That could definitely do. A big slobby dog lick will definitely do the trick. We got put in an empty glass to amplify the sound. Yep, no, a nice bit of reverberation. That always works. Tape it to you, especially if you tape it to your ear. Move it to the other side of the room, forcing you to get up. That's a good one, but sometimes I just... <laughs> Finding a really obnoxious ringtone. Or like Crazy Frog. Does anyone remember that? That was that was the good old days. Train my cat. <laughs> I would love to see that. Put a phone on vibrate and put it under your pillow. Nice. To be fair, I'd probably enjoy the vibration and just leave it. Set an additional alarm or a clock or put a snooze alarm on. A mullet that smacks you on the head like in cartoons. I like that. Gross, but amazing. Sound increases in volume if not turned off. Set an automatic bulb inside your room. Yeah, you could do that. Put it under your pillow. Alarms, great. And what? how does this relate to dyslexia or dyscalculia? Well, it doesn't relate to dyscalculia, but it does relate to dyslexia. Well, actually, maybe it does relate to dyscalculia. I take that back. Because a lot of the times you'll find that being neurodiverse does mean you become a creative problem solver. And this is a phrase which is chucked around left, right and centre. But what does it actually mean to be creative? We're not talking about finger painting or, you know, being good at art, even though you very well can be. It's more that you think outside the box. You're able, you're, you're very used to struggling or very used to having problems or friction in our world. So you naturally learn to find ways around it. So maybe, for instance, like your lefts and your rights, you're always getting them wrong. So you learn, ah. Oh, Lefty loosey, righty tighty. So you find different ways of overcoming the challenge you face. But that skill will impact you for all of your life, not just things that relate to maths or English. So all these great ideas is why a lot of people with dyslexia tend to be, and probably dyscalculia, though I can't back that up, probably do gravitate towards being like so entrepreneurs or creatives or designers. It's not just because they can't do any other job, it's because their brains have developed either via due to the condition or because of the condition to be more adapt um, at this kind of creative way of thinking. So now moving on from creativity on to basic life chores. You're, uh, let's say we've all popped into Tesco's. We'll say Tesco's, not M&S, because you know, we'll go for a mid range and you look at this basket and you need to work out how much does this basket of food cost, roughly. Think of it, you know, when you had to guess how many, like, sweets were in a jar as a kid. So, either in pounds or in a different currency, if you so wish, give a good proximate guess on how much this basket of food could cost. Okay, I see we've got 20, 2. Any other guesstimates on how much money you think this costs. So we've got 15, 24, 30, 24, nice. And as you can imagine, you, we, you have a, a, a range of answers. So we've got what, as low as 15 and as high as 30? Yeah, so you know, we've got quite a difference there. Depends on the shop, yeah, there's lots of different factors. And your brain might be like, 
I don't have enough information. Oh, okay, we even got 30 written down. It, it depends on the information, but for these questions, you normally get, there's a lot of ambi ambiguity, you know, like unknown. And this does relate to dyscalculia and not dyslexia. So it's again, it's sometimes individually, how much does a banana cost? I don't know, 70p, some sausages, maybe they cost, I don't know, like two pound. Uh, like, you'd be able to work out bit by bit, but when it's all together, it kind of short wires the brain and it's the brain just like, I have no idea. And sometimes your estimates can be way off. And this doesn't just relate to currency. It could also be of like, say you're like, you're looking down your garden. So it says, how long is that? And you're like, three feet. And your, your kind of approximation of distance, time, or how long, how long is it going to take you to get to me? 10 minutes? Takes you half an hour. Or like your way of judging measurements is way, way off. This is really common when it comes to dyscalculia. Again, you understand money, you understand like what a centimeter or an inch is, but when it comes to taking this understanding and multiplying it or applying it to a bigger context or a different context than you're used to, that's when your brain runs into difficulties. So yeah, hopefully we're all on the same page for that. And uh, yeah, there wasn't a right answer by the way. Sanjan says, I really struggle to add up my shopping basket if I'm sure of cash and no card. Oh God, yeah. The amount of times I've had to be like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but thankfully having my contactless card has made life easier, but all in many ways also more difficult because it's harder to budget. It's why if any of you do struggle with budgeting, this is actually, you know, strong links between dyscalculia and dyslexia when it comes to budgeting. So sound these out. This one relates to phonologics, which does not affect dyscalculia. So hopefully you're starting to see the, key, the things that are similar, but also the things that are different. So we've got supercadrafragilitic espialidocious from Mary Poppins. Classic if you've always struggled to pronounce it. Then we have t, uh, which is a disapproving sound, which is small, but yet difficult to pronounce. And then we've got whatever the hell this one is, which apparently is a lung disease. I've used these as examples before, but I quite like them. And the reason why this is the biggest word, well, no, it's the second biggest word, but we may be able to pronounce that, is just because we remember it from Mary Poppins. So, it, you know, we remember uh, verbally. The second one is small, but because we've never seen those certain words together before, we don't have, like, the algorithm or the pattern to be able to read out. And the last one... It's just too, like, our brains just, like, it look at it and it runs a mile and just won't even attempt it. And this is kind of very much dyslexia. It's not people who cannot read, but it's the way we read is different. And as such, it makes reading longer words, which can normally be broken down into segments or phonologics, very, very difficult. Uh, yeah, so it's also, Megan says, can't pronounce my R's, says W instead. That's also really common as well to mispronounce words. Uh, it's There's multiple ways of why you mispronounce. Either the muscles like haven't, like, they're not working as fast as they should be. It could be that the mind just didn't learn them and then it just repeated what the way again and again and again. Or um, it's like the way you pronounce the words. So there's multiple reasons why we pronounce words... Uh, I don't like ever saying the word wrong because it depends who you're asking. Yeah, we, you know, if you live in like Edinburgh, as some of you do, to the land of London, we do pronounce words different. And that's because of dialect and how things were done once and repeated time and time again. It's only when you do not pronounce the words in the way that most people do in your area. So again, if you pronounce words different, if you live in a new place from where you were originally brought up, you're not pronouncing it wrong, you're just pronouncing it different. I'm sure there's some instances where that's not true, but you get the gist. Yeah, that's because you're not from God's country. <laughs> uh, with extremely long words, I always pronounce wrong, especially vowels. Yeah, it can depend on certain words, like tongue twisters I really struggle with. Another dyscalculia one. And I want you to put these Roman numeral symbols in order. 
So have a look at them. So whichever one is comes first, put as a number one, and whichever one comes last, number five, put at the bottom. Okay, great. One. So we've got one, four, five, six, ten. Nice. So yeah, I think as a group, you all got this correct. And I think so anyway. <laughs> but I, this is something I can really struggle with because, again, most of us can count to five. But some of us may particularly struggle with this. Why? It's because it's a different way of displaying the information to what we've become accustomed to. And our brains can struggle. Remember when we were looking at the clock earlier on? So if you change the patterns or the symbols or there's like alternative ways of writing the same thing, that's when you can kind of trip the brain up and it can really struggle. The only way I remember these is through Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> um, but also the four and six are the ones I really struggle with. And it's just because they're so similar, like one V, I don't know. Yeah, Megan says I struggle with foreign languages. Really, really common. If people say, oh, you're just being lazy, you're not. Dyslexics really do struggle with foreign languages. And it's you. It's definitely possible, but I'm just saying maybe it's going to be a bit more of an uphill battle than those who do not have it. Uh, maybe, I think you can hopefully see now the similarities between dyslexia and dysprax dyslexia and dyscalculia Though they are very, they are separate conditions, you can kind of see how getting this wrong and foreign languages are quite similar. Because it's saying the same thing, hello, bonjour, hola, that they, they all mean the same thing. But because you have to kind of think about placing in the right order, it can be quite confusing. It's why some people who are dyslexic and multilingual know more than one language might, you know, kind of like, every now and then insert the wrong language into a sentence that they weren't intending. Stephen says, the V is five, I think. One before is less and one after is more. Good. I always struggle to remember this. Oh, Megan, I get you. I can speak, sev speak several, but I struggle with the numbers in all languages. Oh, Kelly, that's a really good example, actually, how the math affects you, but not the, uh, the language. You're, you're, no, the, I want to say English, but obviously it wouldn't be English. So here we are, the, what specialised instructions or technology can help? Great, now you've told me uh, my brain doesn't work the way that the rest of the world works. What can I do? Well, there's a few top tips. For dyslexia, get particular instructions, specifics, I always struggle with pronouncing that, specific <laughs> instructions on identifying sounds. So if you can find like ways of recalling, like um, I always remember the word said, like Superman and I dance, so I might create like little tips or little kind of like puzzles that help me decode it. Reading programs can focus on using all your senses to learn. So one way I've learned to read is I listen to audiobooks and I'm reading at the same time. So I'm hearing and seeing, so I'm getting multiple senses. Or you might use braille or just any way which makes it a more engaging experience. Text-to-speech tools. I use this on a daily basis. I highlight it and I get it to read it to me, not because I can't read, but because the way my brain reads is I miss out words. So this is a good way to just double check that I'm reading everything which is needed to be read in order for me to answer the question that is being asked. And when it comes to dyscalculia, to be honest, a lot of the support tactics will work for both, but different instructions on retrieving math facts. So you know the maths, you learn the facts, but you struggle to recall it or to remember it. So is there a way of like recalling it? Uh, a great example of this is, you know, with the, like the greater than or less than symbol, I always remember it as a crocodile eating the bigger word. So the bigger the number, the more likely the crocodile is to eat it. I'm sure you've all got similar things that you've learned or used in the past. Just being taught strategies, and teaching with multi-central approaches. So an example of that is maybe you have an old fashioned abacus or maybe you count using fingers. So you're finding a more visual, more hands-on approach to remembering. It's why some people prefer analog clocks because it's more tangible than a digital clock, or, you know, but we're all unique. Oh, Vicky says, at school, my dyslexic friend taught me to spell necessary, never, 
eat cakes, eat salad, sandwich, and remain young. I still use this today. Brilliant. Yeah, I, I love that. Stephen says, my brain processes correctly, but I sometimes type a totally different word and think, where the heck did that come from when I read it back? Do you know what? We might not always know why our brain works the way it works. I try to give explanations about why these mistakes commonly occur, but truth be told, like, it's, there's still so much to learn. So accommodations that can help with dyslexia. Just real quickly, extra time. Most people can get 25% extra time. It levels the playing field. Extra time to read and write. Maybe I'll read it myself and then I'll get my computer to read it just to double check. Simplifying directions. This isn't to like say dumb it down, but rather than taking a complex problem like the train problem about when it leaves the station, you do one part first, then the next bit, then the next bit. So maybe you're breaking it down differently or using bullet points. Audiobooks are absolutely great. It's still reading, it's just a different way of reading. Ultimately, do you get the same information? Yeah. So does it really matter how you go about obtaining that information? I don't think so. Shortened assess assignments. So again, ask for mini projects rather than big projects. It's more manageable. Alternatives to showing understanding. So let's say someone says they want you to write an essay to show you understand something. Well, if that's not the way your brain works best, your comprehension isn't going to look great. But if you could do a verbal report and that works better for you, it's just a different way of, of obtaining the same results. And that's something that we're really passionate for at Exceptional Individuals. We're not trying to give people with dyslexia or dyscalculia a, a get out of jail free card. We just want it to be fair in order to show um, ability and let students report in different ways. The same thing for dyscalculia is extra time, really does help. Access to a chart or math facts. So again, just having like a reminder. We, do, are, we are taught in the education system to regurgitate facts, to remember stuff, when actually that doesn't show intelligence, that just shows good memory. Uh, so maybe you could just have the facts. Have a calculator. Remember when your teacher said you won't have a calculator every day? Wrong. We do. <laughs> There's nothing wrong. Having worksheets broken down into sections, again, that relates to the dyslexia one. Rather than having a big problem, break it down into small problems. Graph paper can be quite useful because if you're anything like me, I write all over the page and sometimes having a bit more structure can help keep that four in place. I don't think that works for everyone. I actually like the uh, the, uh, the non-boundaries or pure white paper, but each to their own. Access to formulas and daily review of math skills. This is really good for retention because, let's face it, a lot of our brains are sieves. You uh, learn something, the next day you forgot it. So finding a way of being very repetitive uh, so that short-term memory turns into long-term memory. Uh, if Kelly says, if I'm totally honest, I don't know how to use a calculator for anything complex. Yeah, I, I used to have one of those scientific calculators, never learned it. I never have less than three calculators on my person at any time. Oh wow, <laughs> Mike, that's cool. Brain train games help my math skills. Yeah, I used to, on my DS, I used to have the brain train games. So just to summarise, dyslexia is typically read difficulties in reading and spelling, mispronunciating, retrieving of words, completing long tasks, memorising and summarising. These are the key characteristics of dyslexia. Where dyscalculia, on the other hand, the key characteristics, you remember, got to be careful because they can overlap, is trouble doing basic computation, so basic maths. Not because of lack of intelligence, but because of the way your brain is processing. It also could be about not automatically recalling math facts. So you, you should know how to do your times tables, but your brain just isn't bringing that information to table. Or the doesn't get maths concept, like greater than or less than. So depending on if people word things in a different way, if we're talking about pi times algebra, no, it's not happening. So these are the key characteristics that define them. Also struggles with making sense of graphs and charts. 
So dyscalculia can actually affect things like map reading, um, which I forgot to mention, but is it all overflows. Imagine like reading hieroglyphics, you know, it would be difficult. And trouble with working memory. I do think we focus so much on difficulties with maths or difficulty with English. When uh, from my experience, I would say working memory, you know, short term and long memory tends to be the biggest challenge um, of all of them. And lastly, applying the skills that you know into real life. You've learned basic maths, you've got a GCSE or O level or two, but in real life scenarios, you're, you've really struggled to apply it. And the crossovers, so where do they overlap? Well, they're both learning difficulties or differences. So yeah, different ways that the brain learns. Most dyscalculic adults also have dyscalculia. So it's very common to have both. Not definitely, but common. Both are creative problem solvers. So very good at finding different ways of solving a problem. As to why that is, whether it's nature v nurture, you let me know. Both struggle to learn traditionally. So you may have not flourished in the education system, but you're doing fine in your job because you found a different way of achieving the same goal. And both often co-occur with other disabilities. It doesn't have to be disabilities or differences, whatever works for you, but ADHD is another really common one to also have. So it's, it's not unheard of to have dyslexia, dyscalculia and ADHD. So uh, do a bit more research on ADHD if you're not sure. Oh, if any of you think, you know what, Nat, I think I do have dyslexia or I do have dyscalculia, I'm not saying you have to rush off and get an assessment because as an adult, the benefits of being assessed, you know, they, they range between really beneficial to makes no difference to me. But if you still think you would benefit from the support, if you live in the UK, you can get access to a free grant where you can get money from the government in order to support you in the workplace. So basically, if you're in work and resonate, so think you may have these, get in touch with us and we might be able to get you support to that free reading equipment, that assistive technology, mentoring, coaching. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but just go onto our website, say like looking for support, and you'll find out about workplace needs assessment or a grant called Access to Work. You don't have to do it via us as well, so you can even go directly to the government, but definitely worth investigating. Whew. All right, that has been a world win of a tour. Any questions on dyslexia or dyscalculia or just a statement? Uh, Mike says, I'm 62 and I've struggled since being labelled thick in school. Well, sorry to hear about that, Mike. Sadly, a lot of us get called that, but thankfully, I think it is changing. Nicholas says, do you find it more commonly occurs with dyslexia or is more commonly seen on its own? Nicola, that's a good question. I don't think I can answer that. I th okay, I can answer that. I think I see dyscalculia more commonly with dyslexia, but my theory is because dyslexia is more commonly diagnosed and then people seek further information and then find out about dyscalculia. That would be my guess. As to sex differences, dyslexia is more commonly seen in males and females for a variety of reasons, but there is no difference in male or female for dyscalculia with current research. Dyslexia is about 1 in 10 people have dyslexia, where 1 in 20 have dyscalculia. So there's some other fun facts for you that I've uh, just recalled. Megan says, I have some of the criteria for dyslexia, but I am not dyslexic. I don't understand that. It's so difficult to get a diagnosis. Yeah, um, the way you get diagnosed is you don't have to have all the characteristics. You only need to have one or two, but it's more about how the effect it has on you and for how long. So if it's like all the time and if it's quite severe, that's typically when you'd get diagnosed. But also that some of these are all, they, they do overlap a lot. And this is why I couldn't say if someone misdiagnosed you or underdiagnosed you or over. It can be quite difficult to say. Thanks, Nat. Great session. You're very welcome, Kelly. Can we get access to this session or share it with others learning? Absolutely. We are editing it and it will be on our YouTube channel. Is there a hyperlink to share? Not at the moment. If you want the actual slides, I would say email us and I can send them individually um, because it's interactive, so it's a bit more difficult, but it will be on our YouTube. 
Vicky says, thanks Nat, another great session. I'm not sure that I have enough traits to say that I'm dyscalculic, but definitely re re resonate a lot with them. And that's great, Vicky. I'm not, I'm really not encouraging any of you to say, yes, dyscalculic, but just know that it's a thing. And some, and if you're trying to approach some of your challenges with maths, with the support you receive for dyslexia and not receiving results, maybe start looking for support for dyscalculia. Does it really matter whether you have it or not? But if the support helps you, then, you know, all the more to you. Uh, not heard of this term, but would be interested in a future seminar. Definitely let me know what would work for you. Michael says, when driving, training the pupil would struggle with directions, mostly getting them wrong way round. What is this common to? Yeah, though, so getting directions wrong can be relate to dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia. It really does relate to quite a lot of them, to be honest. Remember, as I said, sometimes the output is the same, but the way that it got to that challenge can be quite different. So that's why it can be quite difficult to say. I'm trying not to be a cop out. Emma says, this session has been so valuable to me. Thanks so much. I am leaving the call now, but more empowered than when I joined and going to get a proper test labeled at school as lazy. So great relief. Oh, so great to hear that, Emma. Thanks, 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 Nat. Learned a lot. Oh, okay, lovely stuff. Are you familiar with the term rainforest minds, aka the neurobiological manifestation of giftedness? Does this sound like something that's worthy of a future seminar with regards to neurodiversity? Do you know what? I haven't heard of that, but I'm definitely going to uh, copy and research that after this session. And because we do have future sessions, so I will check that out. What's the next webinar about? I'm glad you asked. Um, the next webinar is the last webinar this year, and it's on the future of neurodiversity. And it's gonna be really interesting. So I'm gonna be looking at future research about, you know, do we do about adaption in society, cure, which is controversial. How do you reckon it's gonna be changed in the workforce? Anything about the future. Uh, so it's gonna be more speculation and fact, but very much an interesting discussion. So do go on Eventbrite or on our website to find that. And if any of you thought, you know what, this is great, but I'd love to see it again, or uh, what about the previous ones, do check out our YouTube channel, because as you can see, we've got webinars on the Equality Act, the history of neurodiversity, autism in pop culture, and uh, we've edited, April edited them down in a really nice and succinct form, so you just get the good stuff and less of me blabbering. And yeah, here's our information. Want to get in contact? Please do. Our email is just admin at accept.co.uk and we always welcome people to get in contact. Uh, quick thing, Megan, do I go to my GP to get a diagnosis? For autism and ADHD, definitely the good place starting point. They typically don't do it for dyslexia or dyspraxia, but there's no harm in asking them for referrals. Sanjan, I'm interested in how neurodiversity is going to transform the workplace. That will be covered in next week's webinar. Great, hopefully I answered all of your questions, but if I missed any, just email me. But that's enough for today, so I hope you have a great rest of your day, everyone. Cool. Bye.